I want to ask you all a million dollar question. What is the most common transplant procedure that is carried out in the world? Is it heart transplantation? Or hair transplantation? Or is it blood transfusion? Definitely not hair transplantation. <laughs> 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 right. Oh, you got that right. Absolutely right. Unfortunately, I do not have a million dollars, but you're right. So, <clears throat> at the end of this presentation, I would like you guys to know what are hemoglobin based oxygen carriers, why hemoglobin itself is not the perfect solution for blood transfusions, and lastly, what is polyhemoglobin and why it does not cause vasopressor effect. What is vasopressor effect? We'll get there. So we, need, we now we know that blood transfusion is the most common transplantation procedure. We already know that. But just to make it a bit more interesting, more than 85 million units of RBCs are transfused every year, more than 85 million units. More than 30 million units of RBCs are transfused in US alone. And in every two seconds, someone needs blood in US alone, which tells us blood transfusion, it's really important, we do have a need. What about the supply? What about the supply? <clears throat> Unfortunately, we have reduced number of adequate donors. Why? Any guesses? HIV? Hepatitis C. And they won't take my blood because I lived in England oh. and during the mad cow yeah. epidemic and they'll never take my blood again. They, they restrict a lot of people from donating blood. Yeah. You see? Yeah. So we have a limitation. Lots of anemic people as well. Yeah. Then we have an aging population. And imagine a mom running, asking people to get blood for her old negative child who wants to go for a traumatic surgery. She needs blood on spot. We don't have that. So we know there is a demand, there is a need, and we also know there is a limited supply. <clears throat> a dumb guy like me would quickly think, what about hemoglobin? Isolated from animals, purify, clone or recombinant technology or whatnot, multiply, transfuse. This is the first thing that I thought, and I thought I was smart. But guess what? Hemoglobin just doesn't work. Why? It breaks down into different components. Let's make it simple. Let's think of it like small molecules. Those molecules, <coughs> excuse me, cause a lot of damage. Just since we're doing this hemoglobin-based oxygen carrier 101 course, let's stay to the kidneys. So th basically, they cause renal toxicity. What could be another potential solution? This is the same question that a guy <coughs> studying medicine at McGill University in 1960s thought. He asked himself, what could be potential solution. And without knowing it, he embarked on pathway of nanotechnology. He developed the first nanotechnology based <coughs> device. What he did was simply isolated hemoglobin, used a gel sort of a thing, you can think of it as a glue, combined four molecules of hemoglobin together and made one molecule out of it called polyhemoglobin. The genius guy, his name was Dr. Chang, has been nominated twice for Nobel Prize. So basically, what we do in nanotechnology, we assemble, we use different biological molecules, we assemble them, we make something out of it, and that's what we call a nanotechnology. And this is the first reported use of nanotechnology, polyhemoglobin. So what polyhemoglobin does, as I mentioned previously, 
we use a glue-like substance, in this case, glutyl aldehyde. We use it to combine four different molecules of hemoglobin, which makes one molecule of polyhemoglobin. And this thing does not break down into smaller components, which cause renal toxicity in case of hemoglobin. And it has been used in clinical trials in South Africa. A quick question. Why do you guys think in South Africa? This is HIV. Spot on. Absolutely correct. So a fun fact is, every sixth person in South Africa is a carrier or a patient of HIV. The logical question would be, okay, we know it's in South Africa, and recently it was also approved in Russia. Why there is still no FDA approved product in US? That's the only logical question. Unfortunately, the FDA disapproval came after a controversial meta-analysis published in 2008. The, the really unfortunate part was, there is not just one product of nanotechnology-based hemoglobin products. We are discussing polyhemoglobin. However, there are other products. For example, intramolecularly linked hemoglobin. Just another product. Every product acts differently. Just like your Apple works different than your Samsung, right? Similarly, hemoglobin-based products work differently. However, in the meta-analysis, they did not consider it. They pooled the results of all the different studies using different technologies, different products of hemoglobin. And then they came up with the pooled results. And that results were not really good. And one aspect that was really, really intriguing for scientists world over was when the FDA raised the question that polyhemoglobin causes vasopressor effect. Now, what is vasopressor effect? <clears throat> when we use hemoglobin, it's a small molecule, it can penetrate small spaces, which is logical. So the blood vessels are lined by endothelial cells, which do not have exactly tight junctions. There are some potential spaces there. These small molecules, hemoglobin molecules, they enter those spaces, act as sink, take out nitric oxide, and the result, nitric, we all know nitric oxide is essential for maintaining the smooth muscle tone. Once it's gone, there's a vasoconstriction of the blood vessels. Not good. However, interestingly, what they forgot was not all hemoglobin based oxygen carriers cause vasopressor effect. This is what the latest studies tell us. Not all hemoglobin based oxygen carriers cause the same effect. Papers published, these are the most latest papers. They were published in 2008, 9, 10, 11, 13. And that is why it has been approved for routine clinical use in South Africa and Russia. This is really interesting. US Navy was also part of the whole group who ran the clinical trials. And what they have to say about FDA, these are really pretty strong words. Reviews had consistent patterns of Iran's misleading anecdotal statements. They were faulty, pretty strong words. And just in case you were interested, you can find the link and you can go and read the whole article yourself. So the conclusions would be, <clears throat> Mixing of results from different, using different types of hemoglobin is not the right way to go forward. And it must be appreciated that different products of hemoglobin, which have different chemical composition, they act differently. And it also tells us that hemoglobin-based oxygen carriers have the potential to meet the ever-increasing demand of blood substitutes. So after this small presentation, 
I would like to ask a couple of quick questions, just to make sure that something sank in, at least something. Maybe one question. Is there a need for hemoglobin-based oxygen carriers? If so, why? What are, what are the reasons? Like, why do we need some alternates to blood? Can we answer for the other lecture? Yeah. Any, yeah. Yes, we need it, like for the people who has HIV because we have deficiency in the blood supply. I wish I had one million dollars <laughs> and I could give it to you. You're absolutely right. You're spot on. Beautiful. Hold on, I think if you had a million dollars, you would be poor now because everyone, <laughs> you'll be donating. Give it, give it, yeah? <laughs> I don't think so like you. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, we didn't know you were so rich. Throwing around <laughs> Do I look yeah. rich? <laughs> I don't think so. Oh, For yeah. now, <laughs> after being that 